high standards and low standards and a whole linear range in between. Yep, we're talking standard curves. Standard curves, sometimes called calibration curves, are ways in which we can figure out the concentration of some unknown sample by comparing the signal we get when we measure that sample to the signal we get when we measure samples of known concentration. You probably know that the more Cheerios there are in your spoonful, the odier it's going to taste. And you might know that the more protein there is in your sample, the bluer that Bradford's going to turn or the purpler that BCA assay is going to be. So we can use these sort of proxies, taste or color, to tell us about how much of a thing is in a sample, so the concentration. But in order to go from that proxy, the thing that we can measure, to the actual thing that we want to know, the concentration, we need to have a comparison. We need to have an equation that's going to give us that relationship. And we can figure out that relationship empirically, so based on just data, based on doing using concentrations of a known sample. And so a standard curve is going to allow us to do this by figuring out what signal corresponds to known quantities, measuring our quantity, um, the signal from our quantity, and then comparing that to the signal from the known quantities in order to figure out the concentration in our sample. We measure the signal from a range of concentrations. This is going to give us a curve, and we can use the computer with linear regression um, tools to figure out this equation for the slope of the linear part of the line. We can then apply this equation to our sample in order to figure out where our sample is. Or we can look at the graph, figure out, and kind of look over from where our sample measured and to what concentration that corresponds to. We'll get much more into the details, but this technique is going to be really useful for things like protein quantification, um, qPCR quantification, but there are some key things that you need to keep in mind when you're using one of these. One is that you can only use data in the linear range to calculate your equation. So when you get a standard curve, you're typically in the beginning and when at low concentrations and at high concentrations, it's not, there's not going to be a direct relationship between the concentration and the signal you're measuring. And so you can't use signal in those ranges. So you need to make sure that you're um, not only are you generating the equation based only on the points in the linear range, but that your data that you're covering is actually in that linear range as well. Even if your data is in the linear range, um, you still might not be okay because it also has to be in the range actually covered physically by that line. So you can't extrapolate out past the borders of the line. Your point must fall within the actual um, range of the points that you measured. So you wanna make sure that you're measuring a wide enough range of points, but also keeping in mind that at the high concentration and the low concentration, things aren't going to be accurate. And so your curve isn't going to apply there. So you can't just make your curve super, super wide. Instead, what you might have to do is dilute your sample. So now let's get into more of the details now that I've given you those key points. So hopefully that you will take those away if nothing else. But let's back up and go from the start. And let's start with a fun example. We'll start with a cereal dilution. And by cereal, I'm talking about my Cheerio example. So say you have um, Cheerios and you want to figure out how many Cheerios you have in a spoonful based only on the taste. So here our Cheerio taste would be the thing that we're measuring and the Cheerio concentration is the thing that we want to find out. Now in a more realistic experiment, experience, um, Thing you might example you might come across in the lab is if you're doing some sort of protein quantification, something with say a Bradford assay, maybe a BCA. You do a um, you measure your the protein the absorbance of your signal after you mix it with a dye. Um, the dye is going to react with the protein, then you measure the absorbance. So basically, you can measure how blue it is or how purple it is, um, and then you compare that um, to that you use that to measure convert that to the concentration. In order to convert it to the concentration, you need to know what a known amount of protein is going to look like. And so you make a serial dilution of your protein of intra, of a, like a standard protein such as BSA or BGG, and then you can compare this signal to what you get.
in our fun example, we're using the Cheerio taste would be like the color words we're, we're observing. And then the Cheerio concentration is what we're trying to figure out. Now, why am I talking about Cheerios? I'm talking about Cheerios because to generate the, the um, standard curve, we typically start with a cereal dilution. And when we talk about cereal dilutions, I think of cereal, even though in this case, what we're talking about is cereal as an S-E-R-I-A-L, meaning that we're doing a dilution like kind of over and over and over. So what we would be doing, this would be like diluting something in half and then in half again, and then in half again, and then in half again. Um, or it doesn't have to be half. You can have different dilution factors um, depending on the range that you want. So if you want to make a really broad range, you're going to want to use a larger dilution factor. So like one to four or something. Um, commonly, we're using one to two, but it all just depends on how big of a range you're trying to get, as well as what the linear range of your sample is. So remember that it only makes sense to do samples within the linear range. So you want to have as many points as possible, but also realistically, um, so that you're not going to do way too much work within this linear range. So you need to have a sufficient number of points, um, maybe like five or so at least, um, but you don't want to have too few and you don't want to have make it so that they're too high or too low. And so you make this serial dilution based on where you expect your protein to fall, as well as the kind of limits of detection and things like this. So at the really low end, the signal is going to be too low to detect. And at the high end, you're kind of saturating your detector or something. So in the case of our Cheerio example, maybe it's just like once it gets too dilute, you just can't tell that anything's there. You can't taste anything. And so it doesn't matter if there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, or just a tiny, tiny bit, or just a tiny bit. If it's all below the limit of detection, it doesn't matter. And so anything down here isn't going to be measurable. Whereas maybe there's just like so many Cheerios that your taste buds are overwhelmed and you can't tell the bismuths apart. So when you get too high, you're going to be saturated. Your signal isn't going to apply. So you need to be in this linear range. And remember that you might need to dilute your initial sample down in order to get there. If you don't know whether your sample is going to be in the range, well, it depends on how hard it is to set up the experiment. You might want to start by doing a few dilutions um, right off the bat to try to get one that's going to be in the range. Or if it's really simple to just prepare another sample once you've already seen if your initial sample is in the range, um, you can do it that way. But either way, you're going to do a standard curve or you're going to make a serial dilution typically of your sample and then plot it out. The re there are several reasons why we make the serial dilution as opposed to just like diluting each of these samples directly. So instead of just taking one and dividing it, so you wanted a dilution factor of two, so you're doing a one to two dilution. Instead of doing a dilution where you're basically taking one microliter and adding one microliter, and taking one microliter and adding three microliters to get one to four, taking one microliter and adding seven microliters to get one to eight, we don't want to do that. Instead, what we do is we do one to two, and then one to two of that, and then one to two of that, and then one to two of that, and then one to two of that. Basically, it's going to be a lot more accurate this way. When you're pipetting a small amount of a really concentrated thing, every little difference, every tiny little extra drop on the side of your pipette, that's going to be a high concentration of sample in that little tiny drop. And so it's going to greatly impact the, um, you're going to be adding a lot more than if you had a tiny little drop of a diluted, um, diluted sample on the side of your pipette tip. So you don't want to be transferring over anything extra, but if you are transferring over anything extra, you want that anything extra to be really dilute and not that concentrated stock. And so by doing a serial dilution, we're able to do, um, to reduce the amount of kind of like carryover in terms of the actual molecules that we're carrying over. So we do the serial dilution one tube to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. It also makes your life a lot easier. Um, and there are also ways you can calculate the concentration directly by knowing the dilution factor. So in the case of one to two dilution, you'd have a dilution factor of two. For one to three dilution, you'd have a dilution factor of three. One to four dilution four, factor of four, et cetera. Um, and I have a post on serial dilutions where you can actually I talk about how you can actually figure out the concentration based on the dilution factor and how many like dilutions in you are.
Um, but so typically you start by making a serial dilution um, of your sample. Once you've made that serial dilution, now you're going to plot it out. Um, you can use a tool like Excel, um, GraphPad Prism, in order to actually calculate a, a linear regression based on this line. And so the software is going to go and it's going to try to um, give you an equation that's going to best fit your data. Now, when you tell it to give you the equation, you need to look at your graph because you don't want it to use all of these points. Instead, you just want it to use the points in the linear range. So you're going to choose the points in the linear range to have it do the linear regression for and don't have it try to fit these outer ones because it will try to do it and it will do it and it will give you an equation. That equation might not be representative of the actual curve. And we'll get into some examples later about how you can get tricked into thinking um, that your curve is really good when it's really not. The linear regression is going to give you some sort of equation that's um, in the form of like x equals y minus b over m. Um, so in this case, y would be the thing that we're measuring directly. So that would be our flavor. We'll look later though at an example where our y is actually going to be the thing that we're trying to measure. Um, so you need to make sure you know what your x and your y are. Um, but in this case, y is the thing you're measuring directly. So that would be like our flavor. X is the thing that the measurement represents. So our Cheerio concentration, this is what we're trying to find out. And then M is going to be the slope or the steepness of the line. And then B is going to be the y-intercept. From this is the offset from the graph. So basically how high above zero is our zero? What does that pure milk taste like? Um, and so in this example, what we'd be doing is we'd make a serial dilution of our known protein. So this would be a BSA or a BCG, BGG protein. This is going to, we then plot this out and we get an equation. In this case, for example, we have x equals y minus 0 0.068 divided by 0 0.91. And now we're trying to find, um, oh, sorry, in this case, we have y equals 0.91x plus 0 0.068. Um, and what we're trying to find is x. So what we're going to do is we rearrange this equation, solve for x, and we can figure out the concentration of our sample. So say if we measured that our concentration was 0.8, well, if we were to look at the graph, we can see that if we were to, a 0.8 should correspond to something over here, about 0.75 megs per mil. And we can also plug that into our equation to get an exact number. Here's another example. This one comes from a qPCR I ran yesterday, actually. Um, so qPCR is quantitative PCR. And the way that it's quantitative is you're comparing your sample to two known samples. What qPCR does is it makes lots and lots of copies of a DNA sequence that's present, if that sequence is present. The more copies of it that are present originally, the more copy, the quicker you're going to see a rise in the copy number, and you detect this copy number based on some sort of fluorescence, like a fluorescent dye that binds to double-stranded DNA, or a fluorescent probe that binds specifically to the copied sequence. You're going to get an increase in fluorescence corresponding to the increase in the amount of copies. And you look for the CT or CQ value, which is going to be kind of when that fluorescence reaches a threshold that tells you it's, a, it's above just the background signal. So the fewer copies you start with, um, the higher the CQ, the more cycles it's going to take. Whereas the fewer, the more copies you start with, the fewer cycles it's gonna take, the lower the CQ, sometimes called the CT. Um, and so therefore, you can do a range of concentrations of a known product to get your standard curve that you can then compare your unknown to. So note that in this, con in this example, now my kind of y and my x are swapped, which is why it's really important that you know what you're measuring for. And so in this case, the concentration or in the log concentration um, is going to be equal to CQ of the slope. Um, plus the intercept. And so the slope, you can use your linear regression. So I just use Excel for this. It'll give you the slope, the intercept, and this R squared value, which we'll talk about. But first I wanna say that, so in your in your Excel or whatever, it's probably gonna give you like a bazillion sig fig. So it's gonna give you way more digits than are actually, than you should actually use. And so typically you only have a couple of sig figs. So I'm just rounding things here to 0.30 plus, plus 4.85. The exact number of sig figs is going to depend on things like 
how precise your measuring tool is. Um, and so I go more into that in another post, but basically it'll give you way more digits um, than you should actually be using. Speaking of whether or not to trust what the computer gives you, we need to talk about how we can evaluate how good of a fit the line is. So remember that your computer is going to give you an equation for the line, no matter how good the line is. But some lines are better than others. So you can see that this line fits a little better than this line. And this is reflected in a value called R squared. R squared is going to also known as the coefficient of determination. And it's an indicator of how well the data fits the line sometimes. So this it equals the explained variation. So how much variation is explained by the by the equation versus the total variation. So you want it to be close to one, meaning that all of the variation is going to be explained by the equation. In this example, this one is 0.9922. This one is 0.9977. And so this one's going to be closer to one, so it's a little better. But R squared can be very can be fooled very easily. Here's a good um, blog website I recommend and I'll post a link to, but it shows you some examples of how the R squared can trick you. If your relationship is not linear, there still could be a relationship even if the R squared is equal to zero, um, but it just can be meaning that the equation is not linear. An R squared can also be much better than it should be if you're kind of points on either, outliers on either side um, cancel each other out. And so the, a high R squared doesn't mean that your line is actually fitting the data well. You can Your R squared can also be greatly influenced by like a single outlier point. So maybe you accidentally, you were pipetting and you, your pipette missed the sample because you weren't looking and you didn't see that it hadn't actually sucked up the liquid. So it's really important when you're doing those small, um, the small pipettings with something like a QBCR, say, that you're actually making sure that when you're pipetting, you're getting the liquid up, the right amount of liquid into your pipette and out of your pipette. If you mess up, um, you might get an outlier point. Now, you don't want to just be going through your data and removing the outlier points that you think are out, that you decide are outliers because you don't like them. Um, but you can remove the ones that are clearly, clearly, clearly wrong. And also, when you're doing one of these standard curves, it's helpful if you do it in um, replicates of it. So they do say do duplicates, or what's more helpful, although gives you more work, is a triplicate. Um, with a duplicate, because if you have two things, you're not sure which one's right. With the triplicate, um, the one that has two, the one that is closer to two of them is probably more accurate. Um, but anyway, if you have one of those really clear outliers, it can really influence your R-squared value. So this influence is taking this R-squared from like um, down from about 90% to about 40%. Not only that, but it's totally changing the slope of the line, making it so that you look like you have this positive trend and really you have this negative trend. Um, so look at your graphs and see whether you have any of those really clear outliers. Um, so look, look, look at the graph. Um, and if the line doesn't seem to fit, look for those outliers, look for things like that. Another way that you can kind of see whether the line fits well is by looking at a residual curve. So basically, it's going to look at each of these points and tell you how far apart that point is from the line. And so that could be another helpful way to look. So to review, start by making a serial dilution of sample of known quantity. Try to get a broad enough range so that it's going to encompass the concentration of the thing that you want to measure. But keep in mind that you can only go as far as the data remains linear. If you are above or below the limit of your measurement technique or above or below the way in which there's this direct linear relationship, then you can't use that data. When you calculate your um, 
your fit equation, you can only use the data in the linear range and you need to make sure your sample is within this linear range and within the range that's covered by the data. So dilute your sample as necessary in order to get your sample to a place where it's actually on the line. Don't extrapolate past the beginning or the start of the line because you might not be in the actual range covered by the curve, um, by the curve equation anymore. You could say be in one of those curvy regions where the data is not going to apply. Um, your equation is not going to apply. So hope that helped you understand standard curves.